welcome to Future Squared, the podcast all about corporate innovation and entrepreneurship. My name is Steve Levesky and each week I'll bring you authors, corporate innovation managers, entrepreneurs and above all else, thought leaders on the topics of innovation, entrepreneurship and self-improvement. Future Squared brings you a double dose of innovation inspiration every week to help you successfully navigate your innovation journey. Every Monday, I'll bring you a world-class thought leader such as Steve Blank, Alex Osterwalder, Neil Patel, Rand Fishkin, or Whitney Johnson, just to name a few. While every Friday, I'll bring you some quick digestible insights myself to help end your week on a high before you head off for the weekend. Future Squared is proudly brought to you by Collective Campus, an innovation hub, school, and consultancy that works with large organizations to help them adopt the mindset, methodologies, and tools required to explore new business models and disruptive innovation in an era of rapid change. If your organization needs support coming up with ideas, testing and turning those ideas into reality, incubating teams, driving cultural change, or connecting and partnering with startups, then visit Collective Campus online at www.collectivecamp.us. And without further ado, here's today's podcast. Welcome back to Future Squared. Today I'll be speaking with Robert Keegan. He's a psychologist who teaches, researches, writes, and consults about adult development and professional development. He's co-founder of Minds at Work, a consulting group that works with senior leaders and teams in corporations, government, and nonprofits. He's the William and Miriam Meehim Professor of Adult Learning and Professional Development at Harvard University, where he co-directs the Change Leadership Group. He's contributed many articles and books on psychological development and has published seven books, including An Everyone Culture, Immunity to Change, Change Leadership, How the Way We Talk Can Change the Way We Work, and In Over Our Heads. He's co-authored several of these books with Lisa Lay, who unfortunately couldn't join us on this podcast. So with that, it gives me much pleasure to bring to you Robert Keegan. Welcome to Future Squared, Robert. Thank you, Steve. Glad to be with you. That's an absolute pleasure to have you on the program. Um, before we kick on, uh, you know, you've got quite a, quite a decorated background and some people may not know that you are, well, I'm not sure if this is self-proclaimed, but I'm keen to find out a little bit more, the unheralded inventor of the base average, um, which is obviously, for our Australian listeners, a more comprehensive way of gauging a baseball player's offensive contributions. Can you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> well, I can't imagine that that would be terribly interesting, Steve, to your... Australian listeners, I don't even know if uh, baseball is a big sport in Australia. No, look, it's it's not, but um, I think it's still quite an interesting uh, little <laughs> anecdote. Well, I just returned, actually, uh, from watching the Boston Red Sox go down to defeat last night, so I actually have baseball on my mind. Uh-huh. The base average... Um, is a way of uh, an elegant uh, and uh, appropriately simple. Uh, I say appropriate because baseball is really a 19th century game. You mm-hmm. you kind of sit there and a little bit like fishing. You basically just kind of enjoy the surroundings, and every once in a while something, something exciting happens. occurs. But uh, it's a way of assessing the baseball player's offensive contributions by taking account of the number of bases that they win, so to mm-hmm. speak, for their team per at-bat. So it's a way, uh, it, it has actually been published. It's one of my prouder publications in a baseball actuarial mm-hmm. uh, journal, and it has not been used by any professional uh, team that I'm aware of. Uh, so it's a rather uh, undistinguished uh, <laughs> uh, career. But I, I was kind of uh, pleased to get a letter some years ago from a Little League coach who told me that he read it and that he uses it with the kids because it's a way of showing the kids that there's lots of ways to make contributions. You don't have mm. to just be a big home run hitter. Uh, you can you can even make outs that advance runners because that attains bases. And the statistic keeps track of all the ways they help the team get more bases. And the game is called baseball, after all, not yeah. bat ball. Yeah, well, that makes perfect sense, and I love what no, you no, said. No, more about it than you want. <laughs> no, no, that's more than enough. But um, it's it's funny you should say that um, it's a way that helps little league ballers uh, determine that hey, I can contribute to this team in different ways. And I think that's a good segue into what we'll be talking about today, which is about company culture. And um, you recently released an everyone culture, which you co-wrote with Lisa Lay, who unfortunately couldn't join us on this call, but um. 
And Everyone Culture is essentially all about becoming a deliberately developmental organization. Um, it's your first book together with Lisa in seven years, and the book explores transitioning from an organization where people are spending their time covering up their weaknesses, managing people's impressions of them, playing politics, and hiding insecurities to one where the culture is safe and demanding enough that everyone comes out of hiding. Um, can you perhaps elaborate a bit more about how you came to explore this topic, Robert? Absolutely. So, as I think you and, and I'm sure many of your listeners know, um, I've spent my life, uh, a professional life, mm -hmm. uh, studying the possibilities of our further unfolding beyond adolescence. I mean, when I when I started as a graduate student uh, in the 1970s, uh, if you studied developmental psychology, it literally meant that you studied uh, infants, children, and adolescents. I mean, that was the mm -hmm. period of the lifespan in which we thought development occurred. <laughs> we pretty much yoked our notions of psychological development to physical development. And just as we tend not to get any taller than we reach in our 20s, we believed that that was kind of the, the end of the growing season, so to speak, mm -hmm. for the mind or psychologically. Of course, people knew that you could get wiser as you grew older and had more experience, but that wisdom was attributed uh, entirely to learning how to get more out of the same equipment, not about actual further evolution of the equipment right. uh, itself. And so I've been studying the trajectory of development mm -hmm. uh, with my colleagues, and uh, we then turned, uh, and I, I credit uh, my colleague of 30 years now, Lisa Leahy, mm -hmm. uh, with really uh, instigating this, came to me, you know, 30 years ago and said that, you know, it's a good theory. Now, how are we going to actually make use of it? And we started turning toward the educator's question, what are the ways you can actually support development? Mm -hmm. And uh, we created uh, over about 20 years this immunity to change coaching approach, uh, which uh, has turned out to be very powerful and sort of humbling uh, with respect to its influence. It's got much more traction uh, than the base average, Steve. <laughs> well, I'm glad but to hear that. <laughs> we then turned our attention to, okay, this is, this is a powerful way of engaging a single individual, for example, in uh, like executive coaching kinds of things or even a small team. But we asked ourselves, you know, if you so value developing the capabilities of your people, mm -hmm. if as a leader of an organization you recognized, as most do, that you're only going to go as far as your people will take you. And so you wanted to create an organization that would be the world's most powerful incubator for supporting the ongoing development of your people. Right. What would your organization look like, mm -hmm. you know, if it were to actually take account of the science of adult development and neuroscience? And, you know, that that's what led us into really starting to look at organizations, ask ourselves, how well do they actually do uh, in terms of truly developing their people. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think um, it, it reminds me of you know moving from a fixed mindset essentially to a growth mindset. And I mean, yeah. would you say that changing the equipment is more important today than it's ever been before, given the world's uh, you know, moving so quickly and where we're entering a more uncertain environment where many of today's jobs may not exist in you know, five or 10 years time? Exactly, exactly. And what we came to see was you know, even though most organizations say they care about people development mm -hmm. and they do a lot, you know, with and for their people, and I don't doubt, you know, the sincerity of that, when you actually look at what they are doing, I have a picture now in my office of a 19th century surgical room, mm -hmm. and you see uh, three very, very conscientious and concerned uh, surgeons, you know, standing around the patient on the table. But one of the things you're struck by, having watched enough, you know, medical television shows, is that not one of them is wearing a white lab coat, no one's wearing a mask, mm -hmm. no one's wearing gloves, and, you know, this has something to do with why even when surgeons in the 19th century understood the the particular uh, surgical procedure 
they were trying to enact and understood it correctly, they still had such high mortality rates from surgery because we didn't yet we didn't yet have a germ theory. We didn't yet understand anything about infection mm -hmm. or sterility. And when we look at organizations today, given that we've spent our lives studying adult development, it kind of looks like, you know, organizations that in, in not taking account of all of the science of adult development are basically trying to do the best they can, but, you know, without a germ theory. Yeah, that's an interesting um, analogy there. And um, I mean, uh, most of our audience are quite, I mean, whether they're entrepreneurs or involved with corporate innovation, I think this topic is quite relevant. Um, for example, on innovation, organizations usually host, say, brainstorming events. Um, but the problem often with brainstorming events or workshops is that people are essentially scared to say something in case they come across as stupid or ignorant. However, as, as you'd probably appreciate, Robert, innovation thrives when many disparate ideas come together and are built upon over time by different people. Um, essentially, there are no bad ideas, and innovation by its nature is quite, quite chaotic. Um, how important is it that an organization becomes a deliberately developmental organization in order to support you know, that unbridled creativity and innovation? Yeah, I think, I think that the, the DDO, as we call it for short, mm -hmm. since the deliberately developmental organization is quite a mouthful, yeah. is, is, uh, is, the, is really the, the, the premier organization, if you're interested in something like innovation mm -hmm. or meeting adaptive challenges. I mean, what we did was, Steve, we, we, we had our kind of beginning picture mm -hmm. of what a tw truly 21st century organization would look like if it were going to be a great incubator of development. And then we kind of cast around, uh, admittedly, within the U.S. As we wanted to be able to uh, study these organizations, and it wouldn't be too convenient to you know, fly to Australia. I'm mm -hmm. not saying that there aren't lots of DDOs elsewhere, but we confined ourselves to the U.S. We interviewed a number of companies, even very, you know, kind of iconic and celebrated companies where the leaders even would say to us themselves, you know, that's interesting what you're looking for, and that's about 20% of what we were able to do. You know, we're really not a DDO. And we wanted to know, you know, is this just some kind of a fantasy idea in the head of professors, or could we actually find organizations that actually were doing the sorts of things that we thought would be necessary mm. to truly develop your people? And we found three, three organizations, and we, you know, studied the heck out of them. Yep. That's really what the, what the whole book is based on. They were courageous and generous and let us into every nook and cranny of the company. And to go back to your question, I mean, one of the first things you see in these companies is that they create a climate for mistake making and error yeah. and, and not worrying about having a bad idea that is, it's almost as if you were to take the entrepreneur's mantra, you know, that you need to fail fast, you need to fail frequently, and you need to fail forward, that is learn from the failure and apply that mantra not just to your, you know, your, your business model, but apply it to people development itself. Mm -hmm. What would you need to do to create a culture where instead of trying to always be at your best and to never fail mm -hmm. and to never look stupid and so on, you create a culture where people are actually much more comfortable failing frequently, fast, and forward. That's right. And I think Intuit is one such organization who I believe they have monthly events where they get up and basically celebrate people's smart failures. Um, you know, obviously there is a difference between a smart failure and, you know, for lack of a better word, a dumb failure where we basically plow too much money into something over too long a period, but a, a small failure where you get the requisite learning you need and it doesn't cost that much money. Um, and I think we definitely need to be encouraging that type of thing. And out of curiosity, Robert, you said three, you found three organizations. Um, I mean, is that out of a number of organizations that you spoke to? How long did it take you to find those organizations? I guess I'm curious to find out what the ratio was. I don't really know if it, we can scientifically say what the ratio is. I can kind of tell you the facts that mm -hmm. we, and we have quite a number of friends. We serve a lot of organizations. And so we had a, quite a good Rolodex. We put the word out for what we were looking for. We got about 
30 candidates mm -hmm. of, you know, really very interesting organizations. We don't name any of the ones we didn't choose uh, for obvious reasons, mm -hmm. but they're most of them, as we looked into them, you know, very impressive in various respects. But of those 30, mm -hmm. you know, that we interviewed and explored, you know, there were really only three that kind of, uh, you know, matched up to what we were looking for. But, uh, you know, I'm not a hard scientist, but I'm, mm. I'm not so soft that I would say that you could conclude from that that, you know, 10% of the companies, you know, in the world are DDOs. I think it's a much, much tinier percentage because mm. the sample that we were working from from the start were companies that were already nominated by people as ones that they thought would possibly qualify. Yeah, yeah. And uh, keen to explore a little bit further on the three companies that you identified. I mean, are these companies that have a, a track record in innovation in pushing the boundaries when it comes to you know, new product development? Or Yeah, and, and you know, that turned out to be very uh, – <laughs> we were very happy to see that as we began to explore these companies, they were not only – extraordinary and we should probably get into some of their practices so your listeners mm -hmm. can get more of a sense of that but they were not only extraordinary in their in their people development but they also turned out to be just damn good businesses by any conventional metric which obviously was important to us because we didn't want people dismissing the work on the basis that yeah this is this is probably great for its employees but mm -hmm. they're not going to be around there much longer because you got lousy businesses, and it's no way to run a business. In fact, every all three of these companies are very, very distinctive within their sector. So the company that's probably best known to people is Bridgewater, the world's largest and most successful hedge fund. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's just had an extraordinary kind, you know, of performance record. But, yeah. you know, uh, a second company is an e-commerce business. Uh, called Next Jump, uh, that uh, I think it was Inc. Magazine published an article on you know the the best company you've never heard of. They sure. won the McKinsey Award for uh, innovation. They're a tech company that has to live with uh, a, a, an industry where you hire up these very bright young people from uh, tech schools. And uh, Charlie Kim, the uh, CEO of Next Jump, told us that. They were getting recruiting office offers, you know, on a almost, you know, every two, three weeks, and that the average turnover, you know, in their industry is about 40%, which, you know, if you just think about that, that's just, it's mind-boggling. If you think about the, the, the hidden and actual costs even of a, you know, of a single turnover to be losing 40% of the people. And... They have gotten, since they became a DDO, they have gotten their turnover, you know, down to a single digits. Uh, the third company, Decurion, is a portfolio of businesses. Uh, the one that's probably best known is their chain of uh, movie theaters, high-end movie theaters, best place to go see a movie, Arclight Theaters, uh, in the U.S. And um, they, too, are an industry leader. They have the highest gross per screen, you know, in the movie theater business. Mm -hmm. So uh, all three of the companies happily are not just doing something extraordinary for their people, but that it's a true mutual kind of thing. The, the organization is helping people to flourish, and the people thereby are helping the organizations to flourish. Yeah, look, that's, that's a couple of great points there. I wanted to dig deeper on, Robert. Uh, firstly, uh, with Next Jump bringing down their turnover rate from 40% down to single digits, um, it, it seems to align quite closely with a lot of thought leadership out there that says when you give people an opportunity to fail, uh, to come out of their shell, to be creative, to innovate, um, it increases employee engagement and retention, particularly for um, emerging, uh, well, well, not necessarily emerging anymore, but for Gen Y and I suppose your emerging Gen Z um, cohorts, they really want the opportunity to create, not just uh, execute set procedure. Absolutely true. And that, I mean, that is absolutely something, the first thing you notice kind of in these organizations, and we saw studies recently that showed that the top of the list, you know, of millennials who, 
somebody told me that by 2020 we'll make up the majority kind of of the workforce mm -hmm. is we want more feedback we want to know on a regular basis how well we are doing and in these organizations uh, and I mean and I also consult to and serve you know non-DDO organizations just got off the phone with a very senior executive of one of the largest banks in Eastern Europe mm -hmm. he told me that it has been three years since he got any true feedback on his own personal performance. Wow. And he didn't think it was all that unusual. I mean, he gets feedback on, you know, how much he delivers and whether he meets his numbers. But in terms of a kind of feedback about personally, the choices he's making, what his strengths are, what are the areas, you know, that he could get stronger at, you know, almost never happens. In the DDO, if you have three or more people, for example, in a meeting at Bridgewater, each person in the meeting has a, a, you know, a company iPad that has all kinds of apps loaded into them. And one of them is this thing called the dot collector. You dial in a number and it brings you to that particular meeting. It lists uh, all the people who are in that meeting uh, for your handy dandy reference, though you probably know it by now. It lists a whole host of qualities that I think anyone would consider desirable uh, in people participating in a meeting. You know, were you were you a clear communicator? Were you a brave communicator? Did you come up with a good synthesis? Did you, you know, uh, push back uh, uh, and hold your ground? I mean, any any of these kinds of things. And during the meeting, Steve, I mean, I don't mean just kind of at the end of every meeting, let's evaluate how it's going. If during the meeting I'm in the meeting with you and, you know, I'm impressed by the way that you kind of uh, stood up for yourself and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, fought courageously, you know, for a position that you were holding or something like that, I'll just, you know, using this app, uh, just indicate, you know, there my admiration I'll give you a, you know, a, an 8 or a 9 or a 10 on a 1 to 10 scale with respect to a particular quality. I might even type in a, a sentence or a phrase. Mm -hmm. By the time the meeting's over or even during the meeting, you can watch and observe, you know, what people's reactions are. Similarly, you know, I might give you a 3 if I feel like, you know, your argument was completely illogical and didn't mm -hmm. hang together. And when people hear about these kinds of things, a very common reaction is alarm, where basically people say, "Well, I guess I could get, I could understand the value of that, but I'd find it awfully uncomfortable. I'd find it pretty exhausting, and it would fill me with a lot of anxiety, frankly, to be getting so much feedback." Yeah. But that is that is, and you know, I'm not going to say these organizations are immediately easy to work in mm -hmm. we all have to kind of get beyond our ego and get over ourselves a little bit but when people make the shift and this is a profound shift steve where they actually come to realize how much of their life and especially how much of their work life is a kind of performance where they do feel like you're they're on stage and that, you know, you're going to get feedback, you're going to, it's like getting a review, you know, if you were an actor or the playwright, and you hold your breath, and the last thing you want to hear, you know, is a kind of unfavorable review, that is the spirit, you know, to go back to your distinction between, you know, Carol Dweck's uh, growth mindset and fixed mindset, that, that orientation, looking at work essentially as a performance, is going to, of course, make any of these suggestions that your listeners might be hearing sound very anxiety-provoking. And as long as people, even in a DDO, and it takes typically, it could take a year or a little longer, uh, uh, they find, for people to kind of get to the other side of this. But when they enter, uh, entering in this kind of performance orientation, wanting to do well, wanting to deserve to be hired, and so on, yeah, no, it that can makes... be it can be a rough experience. And I think in today's fast moving environment, one needs to be growing uh, perhaps more than ever before. And um, you touched on quite a few interesting points there. And um, you know, the example you gave of the CEO in the, in the Eastern European Bank not receiving any negative feedback. Um, 
it reminds me of a conversation I had recently with Dave Gray, um, who co-wrote the uh, Culture Map with um, Alex Osterwalder, and he gave the story of a manager who, whenever somebody uh, brought him bad news, he would basically bring out the uh, hairdryer treatment and just just completely scold them. And sure enough, slowly but surely, people stopped bringing him bad news. But that's not because yeah. there wasn't any to report. Um, he wasn't self-aware enough to realize that hey, I need to be encouraging this behavior because then I have a better view of the organization and then I can make better decisions. Um, would you say, and perhaps you, you can't say too much, but in this example, say with the Eastern European Bank, is that a reflection of the CEO or is that a broader cultural th thing where people don't want to, uh, I suppose, provide negative feedback or constructive feedback to someone further up the food chain? I think that uh, that company is not a whole lot different than a lot of other companies that we could look at where um, it's less a function of the current leader and more a function of this is the way we've always done business mm -hmm. and the successor leaders kind of take up their role, you know, in that culture and they continue to carry it on. I mean, I, one of the things I've been very impressed by in this work is just how incredibly powerful uh, it, culture is and... Uh, you know, just how it can be just so determining of the choices, you know, that people uh, feel like they can make. But I wanted to just go back and just hope that I maybe, maybe be a little clearer for your listeners. I mean, what is the alternative mm. to taking up work as a performance? And that alternative is to take up work as an opportunity for practice more than performance. Right. And this is the irony that a high-performance culture in the conventional business sense, or at least a highest-performing culture, may not actually be, at the psychological level, a performance culture at all, so much as it is a kind of coaching and practicing kind of culture. Once you take up the position that what you're doing at work is basically practicing and trying to get better. And, I mean, I, I was so struck, like, at Bridgewater, I, I first interviewed a lot of the people who were working on the culture and who were in management positions. And I, I was not surprised, you know, that they were so engaged with the culture itself. But, you know, I said, look, you're a hedge fund, and, I, you know, I want to talk to some of the people who are, you know, doing the heart of the work. I mean, you know, bankers, investment people, traders, uh, I want to talk with them. And uh, so they, the next day they set me up with a group of them, and I said at the very beginning, you know, I'm really intrigued with your culture, and I want, you know, eventually to talk with you about that and the way that, you know, you interact with it. But, I mean, you're also in a particular business, and I wanted to talk with you guys because you are close to the heart of the business itself. I mean, you know, trades and, you know, <laughs> the things that uh, investors do. And they just looked at me like I had two heads, and they said, you know, we're going to try to be nice, Bob, and just kind of uh, chalk this up to the fact that you've just started researching us, but you couldn't ask a question like that if you actually understood how we operate. You want me to talk with you about how we think about investing and credit and valuing you know, macroeconomic indicators and so on, and then you want us to talk about the culture. That's impossible, which to me that was so intriguing. You know, what they said is, look, and listen, imagine this coming from a banker, you know, not from, uh, you know, a, a human potential expert. They would say, look, I, one of the things that's great about working here is I get up every day and I know very clearly what I'm working on myself. I'm working on myself. There's no way that I do anything, you know, whether it's, you know, analyzing, you know, some macroeconomic indicator that I'm not also connected to you know, what I know is my weak side and certain tendencies that can get me in trouble. That's how pervasive the culture is. And when they, once you recognize as nobody's here to hurt you, you know, you're going to hear tough stuff. We're going to look at your weaknesses. But isn't that what you would expect like a tennis coach to do? He's going to admire your forehand, you know, yeah. and give you some uh, chances to hit those forehands beautifully. But, you know, if you're running around on your backhand, mm. uh, you're just not going to ever be a great tennis player. Yeah. And would you want that coach to just kind of conspire with you and ignore the fact that you can't hit that backhand? Or would you want to just keep working on that and working on that 
until it gets stronger. And once you take this practicing orientation, the feedback becomes truly like nourishment as opposed to something that you clench your fists and hope you can kind of get through the, the torture. Yeah, yeah. Now that's an interesting uh, segue now. I mean, I basically – on, on practice fee performance, um, you know, organizational psychologists basically found that once basic needs have been met, giving people an opportunity to develop mastery, um, providing them with some autonomy and I suppose um, giving them purpose ultimately motivates them above most extrinsic uh, motivators. And I think uh, further to that, the, the comment you just made about the tennis, uh, the backhand and, and the forehand, but um, I think that's something that perhaps we lose um, – once we move from childhood to adulthood, um, you know, kids are huge on video games, and you know, gamification is a big thing today. But the whole concept of, you know, yeah. you've got three lives, you you try to get past level one, you fail, you lose all your three lives, but you know where you went wrong. You try again, and then you get to level two, and slowly but surely, you end up completing the game. Um, and this whole concept of try, fail, learn, pick yourself up, keep moving forward. Uh, somehow it's kind of beaten out of us as we go through the, the motions of you know, growing up. I think that's a really good point that you're making. And then if you especially couple that to the fact that we are learning that the story of development doesn't end on your last day of school, mm. no matter how you know, advanced uh, you know, your education has been, then we have to ask ourselves, this is like a bigger question than just about business, but thinking about the human species itself. Mm -hmm. And after all, you know, we've got a lot to worry about with respect to how we're doing as a human species. You have to ask yourself, well, if the schools have been supporting development and we weren't too concerned about the fact that that only happened, you know, maybe for the first 25 years of your life, why should we worry about that? Because that's the, that's the growing period. There isn't any growing after those first 25 years anyway. Now that we know that that is not true, that people can and need to keep growing and developing you know, through their 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s, we have to ask ourselves as a people, where are the institutions that are going to support that ongoing development? What happens when you turn to work itself and say, hey, not just for the benefit of individuals, but for the benefit of their organizations. Work has to be a good school. It has to be a place where people will continue the developing that they were doing, you know, in their quote-unquote real schools. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more, Bob. Um, and I suppose on – I guess I want to jump back into practices. I mean you mentioned one of the practices there around using an app um, to rate people or – people's performance in a, in a meeting. Um, what are some of the other practices that stand out amongst these three organizations that you've identified? Yeah, so like at Next Jump, and it's interesting, you know, as readers will see, and I hope they will pick up this book and let us know what they think of it, the three companies are, in many ways, <clears throat> they're, they're quite different. I mean, they, they have this common thread of kind of following the basic principles of a DDO, but they show you that there are lots and lots of different ways that you can do it. Next jump uh, kind of said, look, let's boil things down to two qualities. It's, it's important that people have a kind of confidence in themselves, uh, respect their own you know, views, but it's not good to be so confident that you basically think that you're always right and you always have the best idea. And let's call that for what it is arrogance at the extreme. Similarly, it's good for people to be humble and, uh, you know, to look toward others and have doubts and questions, but it's not good for them to be so humble that they discredit, you know, their own view, doubt themselves to the point of paralysis, and at its extreme, let's call that what it is, insecurity. And then they said, look, uh, probably everyone leans a little bit in one direction or the other, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe more than a little. And uh, the, the, the two uh, leaders of Next Jump, for example, Megan Messenger and Charlie Kim, they will just come right out and tell you, uh, in Charlie's case, that he leans in the direction of arrogance, and in Megan's case, in the direction of insecurity. 
And you can't spend 15 minutes with any person, Steve, in that entire company without their just kind of folding into the conversation, you know, which direction they lean. So they'll talk to you about this initiative they're working on, and then they'll say, and I, and I lean insecure, by the way. So, you know, I'm working on that. That's their backhand. Everyone knows, you know, what their backhand is. And then there are a set of practices. And in the book, you know, we kind of say that it's, you know, it, there's three features of a DDO. You have to think about the extraordinary nature of the challenges they provide, mm -hmm. the extraordinary nature of the support they provide so you can meet those challenges. And then the third thing is the rich set of practices that enable these activities to just be woven in to a normal work day or work week. So there's like a little wallet-sized card that people carry around in Next Jump. It gives you tips and suggestions for how to operate if you lean more in the direction of arrogance or insecurity. So like one of the first meetings we were in with Next Jump, we gave our little introduction, what we were researching and so on, and we opened it up for questions and this woman uh, jumped right in and asked us a good question and Charlie said, you know, I'm sorry to interrupt here, but I just want to, you know, acknowledge, you know, Denise. Mm -hmm. Denise leads, le leans insecure Notice she's the first person to jump in and ask you a question. And that's because she's practicing her backhand right now, right here during the meeting. We know that people who lean insecure typically speak less and later in a meeting. Mm -hmm. And the opposite for the, the people who lean arrogant. And the way that the arrogant people are practicing is, you know, they're doing everything they can to bite their lips and keep from jumping in. You know, and here's Denise doing what she should be doing. Get get your voice in early, ask your question early. Now, this is just a simple example of a very simple practice, costs nothing, easily integrated into all the natural rituals of work life, meetings, and so on. But when everybody knows what we're up to, it becomes in tr tremendously powerful. The value just compounds. Mm, yeah, and... Uh... I think that again comes back to fixed versus growth mindset and you know some of the stuff you talked about earlier on uh, the hedge fund managers and the bankers and, and people who essentially get out of bed every day and look forward to it because they're investing in themselves. I mean this obviously aligns with their personal happiness um, and essentially I suppose the interpretation of contentment um, with one's work um, is moving away from one that's I suppose characterized by temporary experiences and possessions to one that's more about you know meaning and you know talk about Viktor Frankl's Man Search for Meaning, um, where he chronicles his experiences in the Holocaust, um, where he says that happiness must not be pursued; it must ensue out of everything you do. So, would you say that organizations um, can generate quite a bit of benefit uh, or happiness for their employees by creating uh, a DDO? Yeah, and, and this could be like a good note to end on because I think you're you're raising a really important theme there because. When you look into happiness, and certainly, you know, it's a part of the pursuit of the new incomes beyond just the material, as you say, mm -hmm. that is going to be a feature of work life, I think, throughout, throughout this 21st century, that when you look into happiness, even, even the, the research into it and so on, you really see that there are, there are almost two different traditions and definitions of happiness. And one definition is, of happiness as a state, a state of being a bit buzzed, a bit high, uh, feeling excited, boredom and pain are banished. It's the happiness tradition from the Greeks that comes out of the uh, out of hedonism. I don't mean in its in its necessarily derogatory sense. And it and some of the newer companies, you know, today that are much celebrated, you know, with five star chefs and keeping people happy and mm -hmm free days and volleyball courts and photo machines and all these kinds of things, which are wonderful. I mean, I, there, I have a lot to do with these organizations also, and you know, I admire them. But that's only one, one half of the house of human happiness. There is another path to explore where happiness is regarded not just as a state, 
but as a kind of process. Mm. And this is happiness as it comes from Aristotle and the concept of eudaimonia, the happiness that comes from our further unfolding, from experiencing ourselves becoming the bigger, better version of ourselves that we were meant to be. And this form of happiness doesn't banish all pain. Sometimes the process of our own development is painful and uncomfortable, like labor pains, you know, leading to new birth. And I think these organizations, these DDOs, which the book, An Everyone Culture, to get the name in one more time, that's, it's really giving us a chance to drop down into explorations in the other half of human happiness, where happiness is not just about being buzzed, you know, uh, but where you're actually experiencing your own unfolding. Yeah, that's, that's definitely a great way to, to wrap things up. But um, before we make a close on the podcast, uh, there are three questions that I ask all of my guests, Robert. It's a bit of fun uh, to, to wrap things up. And um, question number one would be, if you could work for any organization at any stage of the company life cycle, who would it be and why? If I could work, for, if, if I could work for any organization, yep, or, any stage of their life cycle. So it could be Apple back in you know 1981 or, or Ford back in 1903. Well, I don't know. This this may seem a bit self-serving, but the I mean the honest answer, and and I think this shouldn't come as a surprise. You know, if I have spent with my colleagues, you know, uh, uh, nearly four years now immersing myself in these kinds of organizations Mm. um, that's you know if I were a a younger person if I were going to be jumping into a place to work today this is where I would go either to a Decurion a Next Jump or a Bridgewater as it is right now Mm -hmm. or to a company uh, that you know whose leaders could be listening to me right now who have an interest in the ideas, are not sure how far they'd want to take them, but who really want to explore what would their own version of being a DDO be. Mm. And, you know, that would be a kind of company I would love to work in as well. And in terms of what role I'd like to have, yeah, I'd like to be kind of the, you know, uh, one of the chief culture officers or somebody who's really looking after, you know, how you tend to such a culture or how you help an organization which has not had such a culture move in that direction. Yeah, that's a, that's a great answer. And uh, question number two, Bob, is if you could ask anyone a question, dead or alive, who would it be and what would you ask? <laughs> um, it's a tough one. Yeah, let's see. I always tell people to say the first thing that comes to mind because if I was ask you the same, to ask you the same question tomorrow, you'd probably say someone completely different. I think, you know, I would like to talk to Einstein, Mm -hmm. and um, I would like to explore with him more. I'm not exactly sure the form of the question, but, you know, Einstein said we're never going to solve the problems uh, tomorrow with the same order of consciousness that we're using today to create these problems. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that Einstein, uh, you know, had something more than all of that you know, to tell us about uh, the possible trajectories of, you know, human evolution. And I'd like to, you know, kind of ask him more about that. Mm, About looking at problems through a different lens in order to solve them. And what is, what are the possible further orders of consciousness that human beings might be capable of? Mm, It's definitely an interesting answer. Um, And and finally, Bob, um, Lifestyle design, do you have any rituals or routines that you uh, partake in to stay on top of your game? <laughs> oh, yeah, well, that's a lot easier. I mean, you either do or you don't, right? I mean, um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I have a number of basically meditative practices. They're mostly kind of homegrown, mm-hmm. like... Uh, you know, a home brew, mm-hmm. but uh, there's a period uh, practically every morning, uh, like everybody says about their disciplines, if they don't do it, you know, they can feel it like they didn't brush their teeth that yeah. day. So practically every morning, uh, there is a, a period of time where I 
completely empty myself of all thought, all intention, all desire, and I'm just, <laughs> I don't really even know how to describe it, but I'm just being, okay? I'm not uh, at work, I'm not trying to do anything, I'm not planning for anything. Uh, and yeah, no, that totally is a, that's I'm a practice so which I've been practicing, you know, really since my, my 20s. Mm. So that's like a great practice, and essentially... Years. Yeah, I like what you've called it there, homebrew meditation. But essentially, I mean, for our audience, it's all about just not projecting into the future or into the past and just being present and, and just being, like you've said. Well, it, it, what you're saying reminds me of, which I hadn't made this connection before, so I thank you for it, is that uh, Eric Erickson, who was an influence in my early uh, studies, he said that the ideal state of the therapist sitting in front of the of the patient or client mm -hmm. is to come to that person without memory or desire Correct. in other words to if you're going to be fully present in that moment it's not going to be colored by our prior history you know through my memory mm -hmm. which takes me back sort of to the past hello the future yep so you just cut out there, Robert. Uh, so I don't know where I cut out, but this idea of kind of standing in relation to another without memory or desire, mm -hmm. uh, I think is a beautiful phrase because it's suggesting, you know, memory is the way I'm going to let the past basically shape this moment. Yeah. And desire is always about the future, the, what you're trying to bring about. And I'm not going to let this moment be shaped you know, by my desire, urgency, or effort, you know, to make something happen tomorrow. Mm. If I'm, if, if there's no memory and no desire, there's a certain way in which I'm completely in the present. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think, you know, bringing the past with you uh, basically colors the way you see the world and colors the way you act. And it may not be um, supporting the best sort of outcomes. And, you know, you mentioned Aristotle and another great um, ancient Greek philosopher would be uh, Seneca, one of the Stoic philosophers. And he uh, makes this analogy of, of animals once they're, you know, escaping um, a predator, once they've escaped, that's it. They're they're calm and they're present again, whereas a human being, once he's escaped, he'll be thinking and, and wondering and, and basically not being present. Um, so there's an interesting difference there between the animal kingdom and the humans um, who essentially <laughs> find it difficult to be present and always thinking about the past or the future. Yeah, maybe we have a lot to learn from, from animals. That's one reason uh, people keep pets, I think. Yeah, I think so. Well, thank you, uh, Bob. You've been a great guest. Um, finally, where can people go to find out a little bit more about you and pick up a copy of the book? Yeah, so they can certainly uh, pick up the book through through Amazon. Of course. And uh, we would love for people to do that and, and write us a review of what you think. Uh, we're trying to get to 100 reviews on Amazon. I think we're about 68 uh, at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, then to learn more about uh, me and about the DDO, I would recommend they're going to the website Way to Grow Inc. Way to Grow Inc. Mm -hmm. com. Way to Grow is the little business that we have created as a home for developing the ideas and practices related to the DDO. So Way to Grow Inc. com. Perfect. Well, we'll include that in the show notes for our listeners. Thanks again, Robert. Um, you've been a great guest, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. My pleasure. Thanks a lot, Steve. Cheers. Well, that's it for my chat with Robert Keegan on culture change and how some progressive companies around the world are supporting it. Coming up on Future Squared, I'll be hosting our first live event on August 31 with very special guest, Ash Moira, who created the Lean Canvas and wrote the influential book, Running Lean. Ash will be joining me on campus before an audience. So if you happen to be in Melbourne, then you can pick up a ticket for just $10 at collectivecamp.us forward slash events. As always, if you're picking up what I'm putting down, I'd love it if you take just one minute of your time to show some love by subscribing to and giving this podcast a five-star rating on iTunes, Stitcher, or SoundCloud. It would mean a hell of a lot to me and the team who helped put this together and would also help us to continue bringing you the caliber of guests that we have to date. You can join the conversation on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash futuresquaredpodcast 
or subscribe to our mailing list at futuresquare.xyz. If you've got any questions, feel free to tweet me at Steve Glaveski, send an email to steve at collectivecamp.us or follow me on LinkedIn. As always, we've got a ton of blogs, podcasts, videos, webinars, online classes, and innovation resources, most of which are completely free and available for you to download today at www.collectivecamp.us. So make sure you check that out when you have a moment. Until next time, keep dreaming big. Future Squared out.